Okay, I think we're almost two minutes uh, past the, the official beginning of the of the webinar today. So let me let me get started. Um, so I'm uh, very very happy today uh, to be welcoming uh, all of you uh, on, online, actually, and to have the opportunity to present uh, uh, today's speaker. So let me share my screen so that you can um, see the few introductory. Uh, notes and okay so uh, today's uh, webinar it's an rff cmcc edits webinar uh, the title of it is demand side opportunities to address recent crisis um, recent findings from the building sector and uh, our speakers today are um, two very good friends but also esteemed colleagues uh, Diana urge from the Central European University and Shuran Chatterjee from the University of Plymouth. Uh, you all probably know both of them and you also know myself. I am Elena Verdolini uh, from the University of Brescia and uh, uh, the European Institute on Economics and the Environment. So uh, let me just uh, steal a couple of minutes to illustrate uh, uh, this webinar and the project within which it is uh, sponsored. Um, as you note from the name, this webinar is hosted, uh, is promoted by the EDITS community. And what is the EDITS community? EDITS uh, is an ongoing project and community that stands for energy demand changes induced by technological and social innovations. And uh, the project uh, and the, 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 um, the network uh, are coordinated by the Research Institute of Innovative Technology for the Earth, RITI, and the International Institute for Applied System Analysis, uh, YASA. The project is funded by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, also known as METI from Japan. Um, what are the objectives of EDITS? Uh, EDITS has three broad objectives. The first one is to create a research community with a focus on end use demand side perspectives that could further dialogue and promote cross fertilization of research and policy analysis through um, the sharing of novel data, novel concepts, methodologies, and policy analysis. In this sense, the EDIT Networks uh, brings together a large number of experts from uh, very different disciplines. And these experts regularly discuss about, uh, and they engage together in the uh, multifaceted energy demand research. The second uh, broad aim of objective of the project is to improve uh, the state of the art of demand side modeling in environmental and climate policy analysis. And this is done via methods and model intercomparisons and uh, also through uh, the fact that the project and the, and the network assists the transfer of conceptual and methodological improvements across different disciplines, as I was saying, uh, was saying before, across different sectors and across different environmental domains. And in this sense, the EDITS community works together uh, based on largely on common interest. Uh, they try to bring together topics which are interlinked, but still develop in different, uh, let's say, research areas and research streams. And they work together uh, on the transfer of methodological knowledge, and they try to explore uh, new model uh, approaches, new modeling approaches across models that can handle the modeling of demand side. The last uh, high level objective of the project is to better inform policy via structured model experiments and simulation that assess uh, what are the potential barriers, impacts, but also the synergies we can exploit and the trade-offs that we have between mitigation and other SDGs objectives. Uh, the focus again is on demand side policy interventions and particularly those in fields which are considered very novel uh, such as service provision models, including digitalization, the sharing economy, or the integration of sustainable development goals and climate objective in a way that it's uh, synergistic. And in, in this sense, uh, currently the edits community is working very strongly on expanding the um, low energy demand scenario and the relative uh, and the connected analysis. And this was, uh, let's say, emerged from the seminal paper of uh, Grubler and co-authors, which was published in, 20, in 2018. So this is to just put this in, in, in perspective as a, uh, as a project and hence uh, this webinar series and hence the focus on demand side and the relevance of the building, um, 
the building sector more generally. So let me just give you a few housekeeping rules. Your audio and video are deactivated by default, so you cannot be heard or seen, except for the people who are going to speak. And if you need to intervene or ask questions, you can do one of two things. The first one is to raise hand, and then we will give you the floor, or you can easily write in the chat. Please note that there is no Q&A uh, section in this uh, webinar, so just use the chat and we will try to monitor this. So now, uh, without further ado, let me um, give the floor, um, stop sharing and give the floor uh, to the two speakers, which I will just very briefly introduce. Um, you know, probably Diana Urge Forsatz. She is from the Central European uh, University and uh, um, she also has served as uh, vice chair of the IPCC Working Group 3. So she's actually just came out of a very long process uh, with the synthesis report of IPCC being published uh, a few days ago, a, a week or so less, no, 10 days, I guess. And uh, um, she will start the presentation today and then she will pass uh, uh, the, present the floor on to Shuran Chatterjee who is a PhD graduate from the Central European uh, University and is now working as a lecturer um, at, the at Plymouth uh, University. Uh, Shuran is also the lead within the EDITS uh, project uh, of a fast track proposal, which focuses on well-being uh, uh, in developing countries and decent living, uh, decent living standards to be more exact. So uh, Diana and Shuran, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you for your time and for sharing your research results. And let me just give you the floor without further ado. Between the two of us, you have about 40 minutes and I will be monitoring the chat to see if any questions arise along the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elena. And it's a real privilege and we will be uh, doing this in tandem with, uh, with Shura. So we will be taking turns actually within uh, the presentation. So yes, what we want to talk about today is how all the recent crisis, we seem to be going from crisis to crisis and how our, uh, want to show how our responses may have been better if we had focused more on the demand side and we want to draw on our research results from the edit community and at the end we want to also do a small pitch for our i also lead a, a fast track uh, the project on actually how to uh, crisis and demand side, but in that one, I would like to uh, all of you to contribute to that. And here we are only presenting our own uh, findings. So first of all, uh, this winter didn't really promise very well, but fortunately, thanks or a lot to climate change, it didn't turn out to be that bad. But the point is that with uh, energy prices uh, skyrocketing, with um, the natural gas imports uh, having major issues as a result of the war, with the cost of living crisis already uh, uh, having a burden on, on people, uh, we were in real uh, crisis. But in addition to that, climate change uh, also has major impacts on our infrastructure. This was uh, the cold spell in the US uh, at um, the beginning of uh, this winter, where a, a lot of uh, families and households were without power. A lot of people had to be just so that they don't freeze. They actually had to get into their cars and keep the engines on. So what we want to also relate to this, that our suggestions, our solutions are actually much more resilient also to climate change. Now, but what happened is all the countries and uh, jurisdictions rushed into other alternative uh, solutions, building a lot of new um, infrastructure, even though already the IPCC showed that we already have $12 trillion worth of uh, infrastructure, which will be stranded uh, if uh, we want to keep uh, global warming under two uh, degrees uh, centigrade. So, uh, and here I pass over uh, to Shura. Thanks, Diana. So what we need to understand that energy crisis has impacted the household uh, in many different ways. For example, this particular picture is uh, actually taken from the last year demonstration where people are protesting in front of UK's uh, PM's house, where they basically claimed and mentioned that uh, uh, they simply couldn't heat their homes adequately. And that is actually disrupting their well-being as well as uh, your standard of living. And 
that shows that how immense the uh, energy crisis actually impacting in the normal households. Uh, next slide, Diana. And one way of actually showing that, that uh, how much the energy crisis, the magnitude of it is actually seeing the energy prices itself. So here you can see the price of natural gas, how it is actually going up. So the blue dotted line is for Europe, the green one is for North America and the red one is for Asia. And you can see that all these three regions are paying much higher prices uh, compared to its previous years. And this is happening because uh, these countries are now buying, uh, you know, uh, they have to substitute for Russia, uh, for Asia, actually, they are, uh, for, especially for India and China, now they are buying a higher energy uh, from Russia. And for Europe, they are trying to substitute the Russian energy with LNG as well as with, uh, uh, you know, with other sources. And that is for which they have to pay a much higher price. And as a result, the utility cost has gone up. Uh, next slide, Diana. And here you see that to substitute that, basically to give them relief to the household, many of the European government now spending around five to seven percent of their GDPs as, as energy support uh, to actually support their utility bills. And through our research, the question we asked that can this money be spent much more wisely, actually not only to support the household, but also to tackle climate change. And fortunately, hopefully, we will be able to convince you at the end of the presentation that there is a mutual solution that we can tackle climate change as well as we can give comfort to the household. Uh, next slide, then, yeah. Yes, thank you, Shuran. Yes, exactly. Uh, the point is that uh, the um, that uh, tackling all these crises perhaps would be better through uh, the buildings. And we already know that the built environment is crucial for a net zero future from uh, the Working Rule 3 report. And, and it's I think it's not a coincidence that the cover page of the Working Rule 3 report to mitigation features uh, a building, which is actually a, a social housing project uh, from uh, uh, Scotland. And uh, it also signals that both the, uh, the living standard and well-being is improved at the same time also the social um, situation is better if people don't have utility bills so what we want to argue is that the solutions are already ready we have um, what we have shown in, in a minute we will show we, in which paper we sh already showed that throughout the world everywhere we can build net zero energy buildings and we can retrofit to net zero energy uh, buildings in an economic uh, way except for very few building types in a very few regions and this is would definitely benefit the poor this is an example from um, from Hungary it's a social housing project because clearly it is the most vulnerable who need it uh, the most so that their uh, utility bills uh, are the lowest we also know how to retrofit because that was a new construction. We also know how to retrofit. This is kind of the power plant of the 21st century. It's the building of the Technical University in Wien, which was retrofitted from this old uh, 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 70s building to today, which is today this building produces more energy than it uses on an annual basis. And here I have to admit that here I made the biggest mistake of my life because, uh, or, or scientific mistake of my life because uh, we have published earlier papers that net zero energy buildings are impossible in you know high rise commercial buildings in areas without a lot of solar power. Now, fortunately, a lot of the professionals don't read our academic papers. So they went in and just did it. But it's, I wasn't perhaps that stupid uh, because uh, the trick, the real trick, and this is, I think, really important in general for our net zero future, that the, the trick to the net zero energy was the really significant reduction in demand. So let me show this was the original 800 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Even a modern office building in Vienna consumes about 450 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. And you can only produce about 60 kilowatt hours per square meter per year with building integrated solar energy. So the 60s is clearly much smaller than the 450. So it wasn't that big a mistake from me. But fortunately, they are much more, much smarter and more innovative people than me. So 
they actually reduced the 450 to 56, so roughly by a ninth uh, to, to one tenth of the original product. Uh, con value or or even from a modern office building baseline slashed it to uh, to one tenth of it and immediately it's possible to produce more and if you have been to the TU building you probably won't notice it so it's a very high standard building we can do uh, net zero uh, energy retrofits all over the world and it's happening this is the historic building uh, happens to be in Brooklyn uh, New York so you can have any standard and uh, and it's, it's happening all over the world. And this is exactly the paper in annual reviews where we uh, collected all the scientific and professional literature as well. This was co-produced by actually the construction industry or, or the building industry and showed that, yes, that the net zero global energy building sector is a feasible reality today. And also in economic reality, yes, it does require a lot of financing, but it all actually pays back even without a carbon price, which many of the alternatives in climate change doesn't uh, don't it doesn't happen nevertheless this is uh, this figure is from the fifth assessment report and what i want to show you that there is a major research gap because or knowledge gap because the vast majority of the models uh, mostly the integrated assessment models but also uh, some of the uh, many of the bottom up models don't really are, are not yet able to uh, to capture this potential the net zero building potential because usually they uh, they model technology by technology and when you when you look at incremental changes you will very rarely or individual technologies you just don't get to the net zero building energy so what uh, what this figure shows is um the building energy uh, projections and uh, these are different integrated assessment models uh, the yellow uh, ish colors are uh, bottom-up models and what you see there is a tremendous difference but it's uh, very often even the the most uh, ambitious climate scenarios of the IEMs have uh, a much higher um, uh, project a much higher building energy use than even the baselines of bottom-up models. So clearly there is a major disconnect between the two. So we, um, what we have done and already started to, to develop our model during the uh, for the purpose of the global energy assessment and by now this is an extremely detailed and very sophisticated model and and probably the most sophisticated uh, global building energy uh, model uh, uh, in the world so uh, what we show this is already from the fifth assessment report and since then the model got much more sophisticated already then we showed um, uh, a two two thirds reduction energy reduction potential through the implementation of these best practices that we know uh, there are already on the ground. So this is our model HEB high uh, energy um, high efficiency buildings model. And let me actually then introduce briefly the model, and Shuran will take it over. So this the the novelty in uh, in the model is that this is a performance based model. It doesn't really get uh, get lost in the detail of what material use which technology use because it has been shown that virtually you can uh, in any um, build any region of the world any climate of the world you can reach to 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year you can reach it in many ways if you want to have very tech centric uh, uh, um, solutions you do that if you want natural solutions you can do that so it recognizes that the performance can be achieved through a broad variety of designs and component combinations. Um, and it's, it's, it considers buildings as systems rather than, than set of individual technologies. And this is why it's a systemic approach. This is why it can actually perform better than, than most of the alternative models or IEMs, which, which consider still that just individual technologies are not able to look at these as uh, systems. So um, I won't go through this in detail, but the point is this is by now an extremely complicated model uh, with a very um, significant amount of uh, inputs, which, um, for example, on the global floor area, also under the EDIS project, we are just uh, publishing, hopefully we have submitted already the paper on, on the global floor area. 
uh, for example, we have been uh, uh, working on that for years to collect uh, the different floor area by different building vintages and, and different categories from all around the world. Also energy performance, so specific energy consumption uh, data we have been collecting for many years. Um, and this all together, we collect uh, the model works with 18,000 types, bu different building uh, categories. And here I pass over to Shuran to continue introducing our model. Uh, sure, thanks, Diana. So what we did in HEV that we try to have a detailed building classification as Diana was mentioning. So that details include not only you know, what type of building we have, that is whether it's a residential building, commercial building, or slum or informal settlement type of building, but also where the building is located in terms of whether it is located in rural or car, uh, uh, urban areas, or also we have actually based on uh, four different parameters, we have segregated different climate zones that were in which a climate zone the building is located because accordingly the energy intensity precisely varies and this is exactly that detail we wanted to capture and within even building categories we have further subcategories as you can see and also as per the building energy performance we have five different building vintages and all of this including actually sums up around 18,000 data points. Uh, and it's actually much more because for each of these rows and each of these categories, we have multiple data points. And with this detailed building classification, what we do then, we try to calculate uh, energy demand, precisely thermal energy demand for three end uses, namely space heating, space cooling, and hot water. And these three, along with these three end uses, we also calculate the floor area by incorporating different socioeconomic parameters into our model. And each of these parameter, I must say, and including this uh, detailed classification of building are region specific. So you can understand how immense data collection we have been doing in order to produce the data. And now with this detailed classification, we have further four scenarios uh, based on, because what we need to understand that during this dynamic time period, the policies and trends have been changing. So we wanted to see and not to predict the future, but just to see some what if insight into uh, consequences for certain decisions. And based on what, what we did, we try to develop four different scenarios here you can see uh, four different scenarios are deep efficiency scenario towards net zero scenario. These two scenarios particularly include the high efficiency building category that is passive houses, net zero buildings, or deep efficiency, uh, deep uh, energy renovation, which actually performs uh, very well in terms of energy efficiency and energy consumption. And that includes the state of the art technologies, right? The difference, only difference between deep efficiency and towards net zero scenario is actually in towards net zero scenario, we include the rooftop integrated solar energy production potential of the building sector. And that is uh, what makes the building sector much more and unique opportunity compared to the other sectors. Uh, the third uh, scenario we have is the moderate efficiency scenario, which basically tells us that if the existing efficiency rate and trends continues, then what will happen in the future? And frozen efficiency scenario shows us that if we do not adhere to the present trends or efficiency scenario, then what will happen to us? And uh, what we actually have seen, and this is just one simple region because HEV, as Diana said, it's a global model. We have 11 different regions in HEV. In one particular region, the CPA region, which has the highest load share uh, within the world, we see that the floor area would actually increase substantially. Then the question in front of us that despite increase in floor area, which precisely determine the future energy usage, can we still reduce the future energy use? And the answer to that, Diana, if you can go, that we see that in CPA region, a substantial amount of energy reduction, it is possible, especially for the deep efficiency and net zero energy uh, scenarios. We see where the best building practices are followed, a substantial reduction around, uh, you know, 70% of energy reduction is possible in this type of, uh, uh, if we follow the best practice region. And now if Diana, if we can go, 
quickly, if you see that global leaks for the global billing sector, this basically adds up that around 77% of the energy demand can be reduced in uh, net zero and deep efficiency scenario. And here, basically what we see that a substantial improvement is just happening because of two things. First is construction of the new buildings are now adhered to the state of the art technologies and also the deep energy renovations are taking place. And these are all region specific assumption and data we are using. So these are region specific data and results you are seeing. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please, Diana? Yes, thank you, Shuran. So um, basically what we showed uh, in the model is that despite, as, as Shuran already demonstrated very well, that despite the major increases in the global floor area, and uh, despite uh, that we actually assume that all of this floor area will get adequately fully thermally conditioned, that means all floor area will get adequately heated or adequately cooled when needs is to be, still you can reduce uh, the energy uh, consumption significantly in all regions. So uh, when we come back to the crises, so what uh, we show in this figure is that if this philosophy is applied for Europe, so meaning that after, so the, the what you see here is um, the if we translate this into the use of non EU import natural gas, so basically Russian, the use of Russian uh, natural gas, then if we assume that all of the energy savings coming from building heating that we use, we, if we implement these, um, these building solutions fast, in, uh, fast enough, but after a few years of transition, because it takes a few years for the industry to learn these uh, new uh, approaches until everybody learns it and until we have sufficient supply of the necessary um components and so on so after this transition period if we assume that all uh, retrofit actually happened to this uh, close to net zero retrofit and all, all new construction is to that standard. And if you assume that all of these savings actually will replace uh, or will come out of our natural gas imports, what we show that many countries could become already um, as, uh, independent of any natural gas imports from Russia 2030s, 2040s, but um, all countries by the basically by the turn by the middle of uh, the century. So, but clearly. Clearly, this assumed uh, this. We did these calculations before any of the already energy saving measures happened since uh, last year. But uh, but uh, basically, what we want to argue that instead of uh, looking for more natural gas terminal or LNG terminals, instead of of, of uh, constructing more um, stranded assets it will be much more important to put uh, similar amounts of money as, as, uh, as Shona has shown, if very significant amount of money goes into uh, saving the situation to actually in, uh, retrofitting the building infrastructure because that will reduce energy poverty in the long term. That will save us from natural gas uh, dependence in the long term. So we should finally invest into the long term uh, solutions rather than lock in uh, solutions. So, but as Shuran said, we are also very, um, after we reduce the energy demand uh, to, as much as possible in the building sector through these uh, state-of-the-art solutions, we, uh, our next model actually looks at building integrated um, solar energy uh, potentials. So what uh, happened if uh, we, uh, if we utilized all insulated roof areas of the buildings for solar and energy generation. So just only those areas where um, where uh, where you get sufficient sun for such generation, because currently a lot of the solar energy generation is actually taking away from uh, from fertile land. And we know that land is ex in extremely high demand uh, right now and simply upscaling um, the, all the um, electricity generation that we need, the clean electricity generation, we just, it will be very difficult on our already very scarce land resources. So we wanted to see how much actually the buildings could serve. 
So we have, as you see, we already published uh, this research, also the previous ones, but I, I didn't have uh, here the paper. So we have uh, by now also an extremely sophisticated uh, model. We started originally from the PhD dissertation of Ksenia Petrichenko, and now developed by uh, Gergely Molnar from Saget University into this uh, very uh, complicated and, and uh, very thorough and detailed uh, model, which is basically called the Building Integrated Solar Energy uh, Model. And it uh, relies on a very, um, very sophisticated, very detailed uh, data uh, sets, several uh, big data sets. So we have global radiation, ambient ambient temperature, wind speed data. We use uh, a lot, for example, uh, NASA uh, databases, MIP-6 uh, databases. And uh, <coughs> for the roof area also, we use satellite data and very detailed um, in a very detailed way based on uh, on available uh, databases from the global human settlement layer and also open street map and lidar data we uh, using a gis uh, based uh, data processing we have now the most detailed uh, uh, estimate of the global roof area and we are just actually publishing that hopefully we have submitted that so hopefully are publishing that paper as well as a result of the edit uh, uh, report now but of course not all roof area is available for solar energy production so based on all the different approaches in the literature we also uh, made a um, leader and open street uh, map uh, based uh, es estimation of the global roof uh, availability. So the strength of the BISTA model that it relies on very accurate spatial databases, different uh, databases. Also, it uh, produces a geographical potential in very high detail, spatial temporal uh, resolution. And uh, um, so it's it's a very significant level of disaggregation. We and then we can link it to the high efficiency building uh, energy model that we have. So this is uh, the map of um, the solar energy uh, generation intensity. So what is uh, the kilowatt hour per square meter that is possible in the different uh, uh, in the different areas? And actually, it's quite interesting because if you see that, well, Europe is really not very well uh, endowed by uh, solar energy generation potential. Nevertheless, we still show uh, in in the results very soon. Or for example, Hungary is really in the green, so it's among it's among the smallest. But still, I will soon uh, find. Uh, show you uh, the result. So what we see that in case after a transition period, um, we all, um, uh, um, so if we, if all available roof areas were surrounded with uh, the present uh, best and the technology is improving with the present best available uh, uh, PV uh, technology, then actually we could produce globally 18 petawatt hours of electricity. Now that's very significant number considering that global total annual power demand of the world is 25, not for buildings, total. So this means if we use just buildings, for PV production. Basically, we can produce a comparable amount of electricity to our, all our current production. Now, of course, there are uh, issues with, uh, with a temporal and spatial mismatch. <coughs> so the sun is only shining during the day and so on, and not necessarily where exactly you are using uh, uh, the power. So, uh, but, um, and Shuran will, uh, will soon shed more further insight into that. But if we look, for example, Hungary, which uh, we are um, the country which is perhaps the most struck or most highly affected by the Russia-Ukraine war uh, for us, we have now the, um, the the fifth highest inflation in the world. We are, um, we are very, very dependent on, or used to be very dependent on Russian natural gas import. What we show is that the solar energy generation potential is just from roofs is significantly bigger already today than our uh, present all of our national power demand. So basically, we, well, of course, if we could store it well and distribute it well, we wouldn't even need to do almost anything else, and we could supply our power demand from from uh, 
from just uh, roof integrated, just from the buildings. But of course, we know that this is not so simple. So this is exactly why we are doing the next research, which is not yet uh, finished, but uh, we are well in the way exactly to look at this mismatch, the mismatch between supply and demand in uh, the building sector. And Shuran will share uh, some of our initial results on that. These are not yet uh, published. Shuran, over to you. Thanks, Diana. So here, what we are doing, basically, we are see directly comparing the demand, uh, uh, the thermal demand of the building sector, along with the on-site energy production, uh, precisely from PVT technology, right? And if you remember from my earlier slide that there were four uh, lines, actually, two of them were from presenting net zero as well as deep efficiency, but the other two, which were actually showing a higher increase, that is, if we do not follow the best building practices, then our energy consumption globally, as well as in most of the region would actually increase. And this is exactly what you see here that in compared to the frozen efficiency scenario and uh, deep efficiency scenario, there is a significant gap in the energy demand. And as a result of which the gap between demand and supply is actually getting minimized in this scenario. But if you look into the demand uh, deep efficiency scenario, on the other hand, you see we could actually you know, produce much more energy than we consume just from the building sector itself. So that basically goes to the concept of building self-sufficiency. And also, in a way, we can call that it, these buildings are achieving net zero status uh, in that sense. So this data now what we look into is actually at an hourly scale but what is also very important for us to look that how this data are playing at a hour uh, sorry at an annual scale but now we will see that how this data will play out at a hourly level and this is exactly what you see and this is just a single example from cpa and we are published uh, just uh, some of our papers are under review presently. So this, uh, those papers and two of them are going to be submitted very soon, hopefully. So they contain all the data for all the 11 region across globe. And for example, just to show you an example, this is an example of CPA region where we see that this is not only monthly data profile, we see that monthly energy demand and energy supply profile of the building, but also a daily profile. That is at the second row, you can see that these are the daily profile of a building. That helps us to understand what are the peak demand and peak supply and when it is taking place. That gives us a fair share of idea that what type of storage we would need if we need at all and also what magnitude we would need that. So this gives us a complete holistic overview of the building sector's uh, demand and supply uh, method. Uh, over to you, Diana. Thank you, Shuran. So yes, this is, as we said, uh, uh, this is still work in progress, but basically because uh, it it's requires enormous amount of uh, data and assumptions. But the point is that already here, you see that under, that there is a tremendous uh, difference between, you know, an, uh, even in how much we can, in an energy supply, um, feasibility in terms of the demand. So what we show is that if we don't work very much on the demand, the, the, the PV potential can make very little difference. Nevertheless, if we work very hard on demand, so if we've, it's not very big thing, it's simply just uh, taking the best practices as kind of the standard or the building code and the retrofit code, then actually almost all throughout the year, you can produce more electricity than, uh, than all uh, the thermal uh, demand of uh, your uh, buildings uh, in the CPA sector. And of course, there is still the daily uh, mismatch, but um, by today, we have several options and the IPCC also highlights that in a 21st century power system, you have many different ways how you can bridge uh, the supply demand um, 
mismatch in, in temporal. If it's a short term uh, daily mismatch, for example, then you, if you have very uh, good buildings, uh, most uh, of the, uh, if for example, passive house building, the really important advantage of them that they actually keep the thermal um, performance or they keep the thermal comfort for even in a, in case of a disruption for days. So actually there it's uh, it's uh, you you can uh, this the temporal mismatch is not a big problem because in fact you you keep the thermal comfort of the building for a, a long period. This is actually the big lesson for example, from the Sandy uh, hurricane in New York City. And this is why um, New York City is, uh, is in introducing building codes or building standards for public buildings, which meet passive house standards, not for climate change, not for, for uh, energy savings, but for, for resilience against uh, disruptions. And this is why I started my uh, the talk with, uh, with disruptions. So this helps also with temporal mismatch, but also it to respond to, uh, to climate related weather and energy related supply uh, shortages of supply uh, disruptions. But of course, we have other methods to match temporal or geographical uh, mismatches in supply and demand. So if we have, you have a lot of supply, but the demand happens elsewhere or, or not at the same time through, for example, energy communities or um, or through demand response, we there is more and more emphasis on demand response, and with big data and and with our uh, recent um, uh, technologies, we are much better able to use uh, shape demand uh, it temporarily, so to match matter uh, better. Uh, to better manage it too. And finally, of course, there is uh, different storage opportunities, not necessary. We are not necessarily thinking about uh, batteries, of course, batteries as well, but you can talk about uh, also uh, thermal storage in building materials or other, uh, other ways. And of course, sector coupling. So if you charge your cars, for example, during the date, daily peaks, then the car, for example, could uh, supply the, the electricity or in, uh, in the evenings when you're at home, you don't use your car, but uh, you, have, uh, you have charged it. So anyway, there are different solutions and these are the solutions that we still have to work on. But uh, the point is that, uh, that if we put the energy production on the buildings, then you also load the grid much uh, less and uh, and uh, have a much more self-sufficient uh, potential. So um, as a final point is, is uh, let's collect a couple of points. And these are really just highlights how the demand side can uh, better address uh, the recent crises. And, and deliberately, I didn't get into all the different crises, but I do mean also uh, the pandemic related different uh, uh, crises as well. Um, then a lot of the responses that we have been instituting. And here is also a little bit of pitch for uh, for my fa fast track um, project that uh, I will work on because I hope to be working with many of you uh, is that these are just based on uh, our uh, results. But I'm sure uh, I know that many of your work also can um, can highlight the opportunities through the demand side that can better prepare us for a crisis or can better respond in in the situation of crisis so let's just go back again to the um, to the building uh, sector so for example half we always just talk about fuels we never talk about the fact that half of all european final energy is for heating and basically Today, we would not, especially in the context of climate change, we just almost don't need any heat in a good building, a well-designed building. You virtually don't need any idea, very, very uh, little heat. So we could almost eliminate all of that uh, half of, almost half of uh, European uh, final energy demand just with good buildings. With that, you um, eliminate fuel poverty. You will eliminate a lot of health-related issues. You will uh, reduce air pollution very significantly. You will eliminate eliminate our, uh, our vulnerability to natural gas price, uh, market price uh, hikes, also electricity uh, price. We see have, we have seen that recently also electricity prices have been very volatile. So you uh, not fully isolate your population, but quite a lot, especially if you look at build, if you integrate building integrated solar energy as well, because if you have, you need very little for heating and cooling and your remaining power needs, much of that you can actually produce from your roof. Actually, your the markets don't affect uh, you uh, that much. So um, 
Also, in the end, if your utility bills become close to zero, then in the end, you also have help very significantly with uh, other cost of living crisis. For example, the UK is experiencing cost of living crisis. Hungary has very significant in inflation without uh, the appropriate adjustment in salaries. So in general, um, also you become much more resilient, resilient to, to power shortages, extreme weather events, uh, also uh, power system disruptions, for example, due to political conflict or terrorism or anything else. So, um, so um, basically, even if you change your energy generation, you still, in the large scale, you still uh, result in geopolitical dependencies. Once you have a low energy uh, building stock uh, supplied with uh, with uh, with a uh, uh, high um, durability power systems, uh, solar integrated solar power systems, then you're very much independent of these uh, political uh, dependencies and, and uh, conflicts. So uh, this was just from our research, and I'm sure that also your research is very relevant. So I do hope that, uh, so do let us know if you're interested in contributing to uh, the, the fast track work on just summarizing your what from your research is relevant for uh, how the demand side can better respond to crises than uh, than very often what uh, what we have how we have been responding to crises. And with that, I would also uh, pass over to Shuran uh, before I thank you because Shuran also has a fast track as was mentioned and and he could also say a couple of words uh, about that. But I want to thank you for your attention and Shuran over to you. Thank you, Diana. So thank you everyone for your attention. So the first track we were working, actually we are trying to now focus on the global South. Precisely we have taken as a, India as an example of the global South and see that how energy demand of the building sector would evolve in the near future under different policy framework. And also in that uh, particular uh, demand framework, will the well-being get conflicted with the ener reducing energy demand? So this is these are the two key research questions we are exploring now with four different models. And it would be really great to collaborate with you all if you have any relevant work on that part. And just you know, reach out to us and we would be happy to integrate uh, them. And we would love to hear from, from you as well. So thank you so much. Thanks, Diana and Elena. Well, my my thank uh, my thank you actually goes to you guys. Uh, this has been a very interactive and lively presentation, and you are perfectly on time. The two things don't necessarily always go hand in hand, but you managed to pull it through. So, um, really interesting presentation. Um, I hope you didn't notice that for a second my internet connection uh, lost me and I was just out for one second, which means that I don't have access to the chat anymore. But I managed to record the three questions that were um, uh, put there uh, while you were talking. So um, uh, we do have another approximately 12 minutes. So I would suggest if it's okay with you guys to pass uh, the floor to the speakers, to, to the people who ask the question in order to see if they wanna, if they wanna ask it live rather than me reading them. Um, I would ask the people uh, if it's okay um, uh, to, to do so, to keep it short and just go to the point. My proposal would be to take the three questions that were in the chat before, if okay, from Leila, Alice and Shonali in this order. Um, uh, so if I see people coming online, um, I think they can be unmuted, right? Let me let me try to unmute them. Um, no, I cannot do that. Um, uh, Can you hear, hear me? The uh, is out if you, yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for both of you. It was a great presentation as always very inspiring and I learned a lot through that. Uh, I have actually a question that um, about the scenarios that you run for this model. I, you had great scenarios about the efficiency. However, also in your model, you have a lot about the uh, uh, floor space and uh, sufficiency. I was uh, wondering, do you have any or test any combination of the sufficiency and efficiency, particularly I'm talking about the global north residential areas or uh, residential buildings, basically, that uh, we have um, kind of bringing a cap on a living 
growing um, um, area and then also meanwhile having a deep uh, efficiency. I'm just wondering that did you check that one and then if you have anything to share with us, uh, I would be happy to hear that. Thanks. So let's take the other two questions and then you can give it a, a chance at uh, responding at uh, all of them. So I should uh, ask to have unmuted um, Alice, yes. Can you Thank hear you. me? Yes. Okay. So thanks a lot for the presentation. And um, actually now I have two questions. So uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what's um, in your opinion, what's the best policy that could implement uh, um, these uh, energy efficiency changes uh, to reduce the energy demand in particular, like the technology that could be the best uh, and also uh, not affecting, not uh, waiting too much on the uh, most vulnerable household since uh, we're talking about buildings. So it's uh, uh, very related to um, people and families. So it could have a huge impact on the income of the families. And also uh, I wanted to ask you more about the demand side part. Uh, uh, so what could be the options to reduce the energy requests uh, of the buildings of the uh, through demand side management, uh, like for example, passive uh, um, reducing the demand for eating through, uh, for example, the uh, bil the building envelope and, and things like that. So, if you could uh, comment more about that, it would be interesting. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alice, and then on to Shonali. Um, if thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks also from me for a great presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so my, f I have also now two questions. <laughs> uh, I had one initially, <laughs> but my first one is very similar to uh, to the one that Leila posed. So I was just curious to understand what is driving floor area demand in your model. So what drives that, and then does it really increase in all regions over time, or you have some caps in some regions or what, how does, and whether you consider competing land uses and constraints, uh, particularly in highly densely populated areas. That was kind of one question. Uh, and then the second question uh, follows again from some of the results that you presented. Um, so very nice and very clear result that of course, doing deep buildings retrofits and going to the most efficient buildings is very desirable from many points of view. Uh, however, we do know that financially, this is not easy, <laughs> uh, particularly for low-income households, because you're talking about high upfront investments. So have you considered or looked at business models or fiscal instruments, economic instruments that could help to achieve that? Yeah, thank you. So the floor to you guys, I guess, Diana and Shuran, if it's okay in this order, would it be okay? Thank you very much. Yes, I'm sure Shuran can answer some of the details better, but I think they are exactly the, the really important questions. So the first set of questions on sufficiency and, and building floor space, uh, it's right now it's, um, uh, that part is business as usual, so uh, or uh, we have no sufficiency considerations. So the what well, the model assumes that per capita living space increases uh, everywhere, but it is kept. Uh, and maybe I think Shuran will be able to say more precisely where exactly it is kept. Nevertheless, we do hope, and I absolutely uh, appreciate the question from both of you. We do want to uh, also entertain uh, a sufficiency scenario. Um, so far, we did not get it to it yet because first we want to see what's possible through technologies and only then uh, see um, the sufficiency. But yesterday I had a, a national television debate and it was so intense about, uh, oh, these Germans, they are, you know, trying to uh, cap per capita living space and it's like prison and it's like they're going to squeeze us into it. So it, there is a lot of, uh, I think it's very sensitive. So certainly we have to be very careful with that. But anyway, I fully understand that and, and we are going to do, uh, we are going to such a scenario and I'm sure, sure I will get add more details. Now on the uh, finances absolutely that's the the most important now 
Uh, for new construction, it's not an issue because today new construction, and we show it in our paper from uh, uh, professional data, so constructors uh, data, that actually it's competitive, fully competitive. So a net zero building is fully competitive with conventional. So it's only the question to me, why are we allowing non-passive house standard buildings when, when it's, uh, it's uh, price-wise not more expensive? Retrofit is definitely an issue. And I think there, and, and um, personally, I don't think any, um, any of the present instruments really help. In fact, they may in, just increase the, the, uh, the, uh, the lock-in because many of the instruments, you know, favor, uh, subsidized loans or the worst is ESCOs because energy service companies, because they just look at the cherry picking. So you have a lot of lock-in left. So you don't go for the deep solutions. You go just for the incremental solutions and you leave the big potential in the buildings in. I actually believe now that the only solution here, because the big problem is it pays back, it pays back even without a carbon price, which most other climate technologies don't, but it has a long payback time, 20, 30 years. So, so I believe the only way how we can really get this fixed is it's if we understand this is really a security issue, this is really um, uh, a social issue uh, and, and if we consider the building sector as an energy sector, so there's so much energy subsidy going into the energy sector. There is so much other fine, and like Shuran showed very well how much, for example, a lot of money goes into just compensating for, for high energy bills. If that money, instead of paying a few people, instead of you know paying them for the energy, but instead it put that money to retrofit their homes, uh, because clearly there is no way we can assume it should be the people, the owners who can do it. They won't even, they are not able to know, they don't know how to do it in any way. So I think we have to do it send in, in as simply as a part to consider the buildings as part of the energy sector and put uh, all these uh, other big energy finances into this. We know how much it's documented in IPCC, the enormous amount of energy subsidies, redirect them towards this. But the other area where I think there is a lot of finance and which would be very good is we know there is tremendous uh, uh, tremendous carbon finance getting into um, into sequestration and and offsets most offsets a lot of the offsets go into into uh, really uh, controversial areas afforestation where we we know it's now by now it doesn't work it's actually even bad I think we should uh, direct much more of the offset the commercial offset finances into this sector and if if uh, and that there is more than enough money there uh, for for fixing the building sector these would be my uh, ideas but of course these are right now now, only hypothesis. We have not worked on this from a scientific perspective. Maybe some of you who are better in these areas can can take on the baton and, and see how actually this can make happen. And I'm sure Shuran has a lot to add to this. Uh, thanks, Diana. Uh, so uh, just quickly regarding sufficiency and efficiency, uh, Diana has already mentioned that we do not have direct uh, scenarios related to that and we would like to but just to tell you the challenge to that Leila this is a really important question you posed in front of us because this is something Diana and I we have been discussing for long now and one of the challenge we face that the collection of data because sufficiency what we have uh, in terms of data at a national level or at regional level uh, and at a detail down parameter is always a challenge to get. But what we need to do then, we need to use the proxy parameters in some cases at least uh, in order to develop a scenario for that. But this is something really important and we are considering it very seriously. And that shows that, you know, the kind of uh, data we are showing, it building sector has probably much more potential than the data we are showing. So in terms of reducing demand. So this is something definitely we would like to implement in future. Uh, regarding then floor area demand drivers. So uh, uh, Diana has already mentioned the key drivers. We basically use population growth rate, GDP growth rate, along with you know, other parameters, socioeconomic parameters uh, to precisely calculate the residential per capita floor area as well as commercial per capita floor area. And there is also another component, which is the slum, that is informal settlement. And our data shows that there is a significant increase in that floor, uh, in the slum floor area. 
But this is something what we need to understand that reducing the slum floor area would not only be possible with climate change policies, but an integrated policy framework needs to be in place. And it would be really crucial for the well being of the individual as well. So this is something we are also focusing on slowly uh, with our modeling results. Uh, so uh, this is uh, that's why we consider it really crucial as well. Uh, now, regarding best policy practices, Diana has already mentioned what are the best policy practices could have been in place. And there are, I must admit, there are many more details of it, and I'm, I will be happy to share our uh, work on all three questions. Uh, but uh, precisely one particular area I would want to focus on and which we often do not talk about, but during the course of our research, we figured out that it's very important is the historical buildings. <laughs> Because historical buildings uh, uh, in terms of building stock in the global north, uh, it has a you know, fair share amount. And without tackling them, fortunately with the new technologies, we see that historical buildings also are quite capable of reducing significant amount of demand. And this is what we have also encountered in our modeling logic. We do incorporate the efficiency of the historical building as well. But in, when it comes to the policy, we actually need to focus specific policies to historical building stock as well. And uh, as uh, you, Shonali, correctly mentioned that for the vulnerable group along with historical group, and then there is another part is the vulnerable group where the finance would come from. Uh, finance is always a tricky issue because we need to understand where the source of finance is coming from and how much it is contributing to growth. But then the question is to ask that how do we define growth? Is it only economic growth, but also it's about improving the well-being? Because through our uh, different results, we have shown that uh, by living in this type of high efficiency building, a significant improvement in well-being can occur through improving health, through improving productivity. So this is that's why you know we see it's kind of a uh, not a dilemma, but rather a clear cut answer that we definitely need to provide them a better standard of living through the high efficiency households. So, yeah, I hope uh, my additions were coherent and small. I, I think they were. My personal judgment is that is that they were. Uh, again, we are perfectly on time uh, now, 60 minutes past uh, the time we started. So let me thank you again for the very interesting webinar the very good timekeeping that you guys have you've been very considerate of that uh, i am uh, um, I, I mean there are there, there could be a number of other things that we could talk about for instance diana was mentioning you know retrofitting buildings uh, one big issue is actually the ability of the people in the construction sector to actually retrofit properly your own building and this is a, a, a significant constraint right but i mean um, if we think also about uh, let's say data calibration you know i am sure that there are areas which you where the data is better for you in areas where you, you still have uh, significant coverage uh, uh, issues and problems. So we could be here for, for many more than one uh, than 60 minutes talking about this, but let me use IPCC uh, language in saying that I'm almost certain, that means more than 99% 90, uh, certain that both uh, Diana and Shuran would be very willing to reply to any questions we still have left by email. Uh, I think I can safely say that. And um, uh, just in the interest of keeping time, I will close the seminar right now. Um, and again, thank you very much, very much for a very interesting presentation, perfectly handled. Thank you, Elena, for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Bye. thank you for joining us today. Okay, so then goodbye to all, and let's just plan to work still on this uh, very important topic of the man side through the edits project of reaching out within, uh, you know, to each other if there is interest to collaborate, because Diana and Shuran clearly asked for that if you're interested. So, okay, then uh, have a good uh, rest of the afternoon, everybody, wherever you are, and, uh, and see you next time then. Bye-bye.